Okay, well, good morning. Um, <clears throat> so today uh, is is Wednesday. Today is the day we're going to go over sections 2.8, 3.1, and 3.2. Uh, problems from those sections in particular. The uh, One of the sections really gets into a difficult topic, which is graphing polynomials of any of any order, um, which is really kind of a difficult thing to do. So I was hoping to spend more time on that um, uh, than the beginning sections. Um, but if you need help on those beginning sections, um, then we'll, we'll work on that as well. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Section 2.8 was on. I don't know if you've read the sections yet, but section 2.8 was on, um, I think it was just on quadratics, right? It was on inverses. It was on inverses and one-to-one -one functions. 3.1 was on quadratics, right? Okay, so 2.8. I see the, the first question here in the chat already is about this, so I'm going to answer that one first. So the question is, if you've got If you've got, oh, I'm not sharing my screen yet. Great day. We're all over the place here. Sorry, everyone. It's been a couple weeks. I'm out of practice. Can you see it now? I think, I think you should be able to. All right. So the question in the chat is a great example of a question from this section on 2.8, which is one-to-one -one functions and their inverses. It says if you've got a function f of x is 9 minus 2x, There we go, 9 minus 2x, then find f inverse of negative 7. Okay, so this is, the, this is the question that was posed in the chat, and this is a great example of inverse functions. So uh, in, the, in the lecture, I, I hope most of you have watched it by now, I, I laid down a procedure for finding inverse functions um, if you're given a one-to-one -one function. And the way to do that is to uh, first um, write down, instead of f of x, write down y. And then on the other side of the equal sign, you keep everything the same. So that's what we'll do here, our first step. We're, we're substituting the variable y for our function output. And this is, this is pretty, this is nothing crazy yet. The next step is to solve everything for x instead of solving for y. So right now it's it's y solved in terms of x. The right side is stuff you do to x in order to get y. We want to turn it into something like uh, you know the stuff you do to y to get x. So we're gonna we're gonna subtract nine from both sides, and then we're gonna divide by two on both sides. And there we've got it. That's the second step. The step after that is to replace, is to take every single x and replace it with a y, and to take every single y and replace it with an x. In my notes, I said interchange the two. So this y up here is going to become an x. The 9 and the 2 stay the same. This x over here becomes a y. And it turns out that this is, how is two positive? Did I miss a negative sign? Thank you. Keep me honest. Perfect. Your attendance for the day, Michaela, is noted. <laughs> Keep me honest, there we go. So I fixed that, I think. If there's anything else, let me know. 
My pen, again, is not working for some reason. This is what happens when you give your iPad to your little children with messy hands and then your iPad screen is not as acceptive as the pen, I think. Not as acceptive as it needs to be. Uh, but I can't use that excuse for the reason why I didn't write the negative two. I literally never tried to write it. So I think here we have it corrected. All right. So from this point on step number three, after you've interchanged the y and the x, you've actually got your result. It turns out that this is the inverse function written in terms of x. Okay, so that's like the end of the three-step process. So what's the next thing for us to do? Well, our goal was to find this f inverse of negative seven. So we're gonna take this final form that we've discovered and we're gonna plug in negative seven. So f inverse of negative seven is negative seven minus nine divided by negative two. So negative seven minus nine, I think, is negative 16. We divide by negative two and we get positive eight. Is that what other people are getting as well? It looks like in the chat, uh, the student kept getting negative one, but I think it should be just eight. Okay, great question, just to kick us off and get us started on this, on this inverse function section. Um, you're welcome. All right, so now I'm gonna actually start a poll. So, I'm gonna go ahead and launch it. And before I get into the next question, I've got a poll up on your screen. I'm gonna clean my iPad screen here while you, while you do this poll, uh, <clears throat> and hopefully the pen works a little bit better after that. So think about this one. Which test can be used to determine if a given graph is the graph or a graph of a function? This one doesn't take too much thinking, too much problem solving. It takes none of that, in fact. But you might get confused because there are a couple tests that are very similar in the names. No judgments if you get this one wrong. I've been there before, and already in front of you, I've divided by two when I should have divided by negative two. So no judgments here. I'll give you another 30 seconds. If you don't know it yet, go ahead and just throw an answer in. Giselle, I've got your question there. I'll make sure to get a question like that. Uh, Giselle, just to clarify, when you say given points, do you mean given a function? Um. Yeah, like I think that one of the questions in the homework was mm -hmm. like, it gave you like, I don't know, like maybe a comma two or something. And then it was like, oh, find the domain and range. And I was like a little stuck. Ah, given an interval. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, I can do a question like that for sure. Thank you for your Thank question. You. Thank you. All righty, so here's the results. Vertical line test is indeed the answer to this question. Those of you that uh, did not say that, the thing we looked, talked about in this section, 2.8, was the horizontal line test. That tests if a given graph has an inverse function. So the horizontal is good for testing if something has an inverse function. 
The vertical line test is to use to determine if something has if something is a function. Okay. So there we go. But I wanted to ask that so that I could quickly give you another question. This one is actually question number four. Here's the graph of this function. And the quick question I have is, does it appear that this graph has an inverse or not? Does it seem like this, this graph of a function has an inverse or not? answers yet from people so let me ask it this way what if I stop it here and stop it here it doesn't keep going okay does this thing have an inverse or not <laughs> Nina says yes with some with some doubt perhaps that's the only answer and it's well now it's not the only answer but Nina you got it right you got it right Samantha it does have an inverse So let's remember the rule for a function, right? Every, I will say each input, input corresponds to one output. That's a function. So an inverse goes in the exact opposite direction. Yes, this is where you use the horizontal line test. So every, every input for a function corresponds to exactly one output. You can't have multiple outputs for one input. So if something has an inverse function, well then each one output needs to correspond to just one input. So the inputs are usually the x-axis, right? So I'll label that axis the in. And then the y-axis is actually usually considered our outputs. So instead of you know taking something here and drawing a vertical line up and getting the output, we're going to start in the opposite direction with the horizontal line test. So we're going to make sure that every single output that we can pick has only one input. So no matter what horizontal line we draw in here, we only ever get one intersection because the intersections correspond with the exact input that gave us that okay so this thing does have a it does have an inverse it's because when we when we graph any horizontal line any one of those horizontal lines only intersects it one time okay just one time so this one does have an inverse function and it is the horizontal line test that tells you that okay moving right along here uh, we'll get one of these one of these ones that was asked about. Okay, so I'm finding some here, questions like 49 through 70 from the book. Um, you wanted one with an interval, so we will go with number 70, even though it looks a little a little harder. So number 70 um, gives us this function. Come on. It is square root of x plus 1. Excuse me, 4 minus x squared. I was looking at the wrong question there. 4 minus x squared. And then it says on, and here's the interval, 0 to 2. So this is our function, and that's 
a given um, a given interval. So that means the x's only take values between 0 and 2, including 0 and 2. Okay, so just to clarify, when, when a question gives something like this, they're talking about the x's. These are the possible x values. Um, this one says, find the inverse function of f on 0 to 2, right? OK. And the question was, actually, what is the domain and what is the range of this? And yep, yeah, Nina, I can handle that one too. OK, so what we need to do here first is um, they're asking us to find the inverse. So let's just let's go about this the way that the, the steps said. Uh, the first step is replace that f of x with a y. So there's that. Okay. Um, the next one. Yes, Sam. Actually, that's what I'm doing right now. So I'm I'm getting right there. So this is the this is one of those questions where we've got a domain uh, thing here, and then we're going to look at finding the inverse function, and then we're going to find the domain and range of of the possible things here. So we'll we'll come back to that after we found the inverse. Okay. All right. So the first step of finding an inverse is to replace that f with a y, and so we're good. The next step is to solve this thing for x if we can. Okay, So here we go. Uh, we're going to have to square both sides right away. And my daughter is probably dancing upstairs right now. <laughs> so 4 minus x squared. Uh, keep me honest, I'm going to try and do these things on the fly here, y minus 4 is negative x squared. I'm going to have to divide by that negative sign. So I get 4 minus y. I'm just going to switch the order. That has the same effect of dividing by the negative 1. And then I'm going to square root both sides. And this is where we have issues. So when you square root, and I lost a square, didn't I? Um, when you square root something, you end up with these plus or minuses. So this is not a function anymore. OK. So this is actually not a function. Because for every given y, we've got 4 minus y squared, right? And we've either got the plus of it or the minus of that square root. So there's two outputs. You're a little confused. Yeah, I've lost, like, when you started going from y squared to y squared minus 4, mm -hmm. and you squared both sides, why do you still keep the y squared? Okay. Um, right, so... So I'll, I'll write out what I did here. Um, so on this on this on this uh, right side here, we've got the square root of something. And in order to undo a square root, we remember, we remember I hope that the square root of something the square root of something is the same as that something to the one half power. So y square rooted, great day, square rooted is the same as y to the 1 half. So if you square both sides, we can use our powers rules and say that this is y to the 1 half times 2, which is y to the first power, which is just y. So that, that's the thing I did right here, going from this first step down to the second step. I squared both sides, right? 
Okay, I don't know if that was your question or not. But then to go from here to here, which I think is where your question is, I just subtracted four from both sides. And then you said, uh, after you have x squared on the right-hand side, right. you also have y squared on the left-hand side. After you squared it, that's where we got the plus or minus? After I square root. Uh, let me let me get there. So, so your question is actually on this bottom line. It's actually right here, huh? That's 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 a question. It's it's actually why do we have this plus or minus? Right? Yeah. Like why do we have why do we still have y squared rather than having to square root it from both sides? Oh, okay, so I'm applying the square root to the entire left side and to the entire right side. Oh, okay, I thought it was just for the y squared. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, when you when you're doing things like squaring, rooting, you know, whatever, you're you're doing that operation to the entire left side or you know, to, to both sides entirely. Yep. Are there other questions? Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, so the next step is, uh, and I'm I'm just gonna trudge you know trudge forwards here, even though we've got a non-function. The next step is to interchange the x's and the y's, and then replace the y with the f inverse. So three f inverse of x is this y, which we've interchanged with the x now. So this one is equal to plus or minus the square root of four minus y x squared. Okay, so this is our proposed inverse function. All right, but as I said, this actually is not a function because we've got a plus or minus there. So if I plugged in a given x, I could get both the positive and the negative of this root out. Now, one thing to, to just check here, these positive values that we, or these possible values that we had from the very beginning, we had zero to two. So let's, let's see now how that impacts this problem. So what are the possible um, what are the possible outputs what's the what are the possible outputs for this function So what's the range? Well, if I plug in zero, I'm gonna get f the square root of four minus something, right? So at zero, we get this, we get, we get two. When we plug in zero, we get the square root of four, which is two. This function is a nice continuous function. When we when we plug in two, we get the square root of four minus four, which is square root of zero, which is zero. This is a nice continuous function. If we graph this thing, what we would see is that this graph is actually just decreasing. So it's, it, it actually is going to take its maximum value right there when you plug in zero. Okay. Um, with a little bit of more exploration, you, you, you could go do that as well. Um, and maybe I'll show that to you right now if, if you don't, if you are a little confused. How are we doing? How? I'm still a little confused. Yeah. Like, before. I kind of understand how you got the range because after you got um, your answer, you plugged in zero. 
But I don't know. Like, is there supposed to be like an X somewhere that you plug in if, that you plug it in on the other half of the equation? I don't know what the question is. To be honest, I'm just a little confused. Still. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no problem. I understand not knowing what to not knowing what to ask. I totally get that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So. Hmm. I used to have this professor that would say in situations like this, um, well, there's three options. He could uh, he could say exactly what he said again, or two, he could say exactly what he said again, but a little louder, or three, he could just walk out of the room. So I'm going to try option four. Let's think about what an inverse is, right? The I gave an example, a real world example of sort of an inverse process uh, in the lecture, and it was putting on a shoe and taking off a shoe. Now, there are shortcuts you can make by slipping shoes on and slipping shoes off, but I'm going to say that this has to be putting on a shoe with every detail taken care of. So the first step, you put on a sock. The second step, you put your, your foot into the shoe. The third step, you tie the shoelaces. So the inverse has to be the exact opposite process. So you untie your shoes. You do the opposite of tying them first because you did that last. Then you do the opposite of putting your foot into the shoe, which is taking your foot out of the shoe. Then you do the opposite of putting your sock on, which means taking your sock off. So this, this inverse function thing with this square root of 4 minus x squared, what is it telling us to do first? I'm going to say solve for x. I don't know, though. <laughs> yeah, no, if you were to like. Or if you, if find you were, the square root. Yeah, so like you think about this, how do you compute y? If I gave you an x, what's the very first thing that you're going to do? Okay, so, so like if you gave me an x to like plug in, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would solve for y. Yeah, how do you do that? Exactly, how do you do that? By plugging in X. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what do you put what what buttons do you push on your calculator, right? You can square it. Yeah, okay. So the first thing we're doing is we're going to square the X. Okay. Then what do we do? So I'll, I'll I'll list these out. So first, square X. Okay. Now what? Then you subtract four from each side. Uh, I'm not talking about solving. I'm talking about if you were to actually compute this, what's the next step that you do? You've you've now just gotten, you know, the square of X. So now what do you do? You Five, take four minus whatever that. Yeah. Yeah. Is. Exactly, exactly. So you, you subtract from 4 whatever you just got. So subtract. Sub. From 4. X squared. All right, we take that X squared that we just did, and we subtract it from 4. Okay, very good. What's the next step? And it's the last one. Find the square root. The square root. I cannot believe this. Does my finger work? Not really. I'm gonna I'm gonna close the program and reopen it up. Hopefully that saves us some headaches here. Okay, that didn't take too long. Let's see. Oh, 
Okay, I am done with that. So, hold on one sec. We're gonna do this with the old mouse. So the first step, like we correctly determined was one square x. The second step was to subtract from for the x squared. Then third, we square rooted the whole thing. Okay, so this is what our function was. So this was what we do to compute f of x. Very good. So for the inverse function, what are we doing? We're doing everything in the opposite order in the inverse way. Okay? So if I if I said what's the inverse of some y value? So here's some output that you got through this process. How, what did I plug in to get that? You're going to take these exact steps in the exact opposite order. That's exactly how you're going to do it. You're going to undo the whole thing. So the first step, we're going to square it. And then why are we doing that is because the last thing we did before was we square rooted everything. So we're going to undo that square root. So square the y. OK? So that's the first step. So this gives us y squared. OK? You with me? Yeah. OK? Second step. Well, the second from last thing we did before was we subtracted from 4 the x squared. So this is this is actually two steps, you know, sort of two things. Uh, first, we multiplied the x squared by negative one, and then we added it to four. So we got this x squared from one, we multiplied it by negative one, and then we added that to four. So here it. The process, the order of this does matter a little bit. So let's think about how we can exactly undo that. Hmm. Hmm. How can we get this? You know, the exact opposite from that. Well, we, we actually worked it out earlier. Right? We subtract four from y. Okay, so y squared minus 4. Okay, that's very similar to what we just did over here. Instead of subtracting from 4, we're subtracting 4 from. <laughs> if, that, if that sort of has a balance there, if it sort of seems inver the inverse. But then we need to remember also that we, we multiply by negative 1. So now we need to 3 multiply by negative 1. And that gives us that, that thing that we had earlier, 4 minus y squared. So these two things together are the opposite of this. Okay. Now the first thing we did before was we squared x. So now what do we do is we're going to square root the whole thing. And that gives us our final solution of 4 minus y squared under the square root. Okay, so if we exchange now this y with an x, we've got ourselves the inverse function. Okay, so I. That was kind of a combination of what my old professor used to say, kind of a combination of uh, step two, say the exact same thing but a little louder. But also I think a, a lot of like juxtaposing exactly what you do to calculate the function with exactly how you undo the function, you know, doing the inverse process. So I hope that was a bit more explanatory. Right? Yes? I hope. If not, it's OK. But I think we'll have to move on because we're, we're taking a lot of time on this. But it's an important thing. 
I hope that helped. Okay. Um, so now the question is, which I've entirely forgotten, what are we at? Finding the inverse function. Well, there it is. Uh, I forgot the plus or the minus as I was writing this. Remember whenever you square root something, uh, you need to make sure whenever you square root uh, a square, which is what we had, um, you need to make sure you've got the plus or the minus there. Because we remember this, this whole thing of if you take a number and you square it, it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, the end result is always just the positive. So when you square root things, that plus or minus survives. So it, it always sort of pops out and that's where this is. That's where that's coming from. Okay. Okay, but before I move move on, is that is this making sense? Finding this inverse. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. All right. So, <clears throat> domain and range. So let's let's take a step back and let's determine first the domain of just f of x. Okay, so what is the domain of f? So our original function is up there on the left. 4 minus x squared square rooted. This is a good thing that I think you should be able to work out on your own already. So what do you think? We had before this interval. And that will come into play, um, but what do you think? Um, what do you think the inverse of this is? I'm just going to rearrange some things while you think about that. domain of the original function. Anyone? <clears throat> so I'll pull the chat up. I somehow got lost. All right, so domain, I'm not hearing anyone, so I'll go ahead and get started, but if you're just slow to, to talk, that's that's fine. You can just cut me off. Um, so domain, the domain is, again, it's the allowed inputs. So when we look about, you know, we look at this step, of, the set of steps that we use to compute this thing, you know, at every step, you need to be able to ask yourself, you know, can I actually do that? You know, if I, if I take any old number, can I actually do that? And so I'm just gonna go step by step. Number one, can I square anything? Yeah, squaring is just multiplying the same number together, right? So that's I don't think that's an issue for anyone. Can I subtract four? Yeah, of course I can, right? Just, if I, if I laid out like 10 dice, you know, or any number of dice or whatever, and I took away four, I'm just gonna take four of them and cross them off. Okay, so I, there's no problems in the first two steps. Can I square root the result of that? Maybe not. Right, because I have problems personally square rooting negative things. It just starts me daydreaming. I, I can't square root negative things. So we need to ask ourselves when 
is 4 minus x squared negative. When is 4 minus x squared negative? And if you think about what it is, it, you know, it's 4, that's constant, and you're taking away the square of something. So that's going to be negative when that square is bigger than 4. So when we, can, when we square something, we get something bigger than 4, suddenly we've got a negative underneath there. So now we're, we're starting to eliminate values. So let's square root both sides. Okay, so I'm not putting anything here because it's, it's, it's not as simple as just leaving it there. I'm gonna ask you what to do. But if I square root both sides, I get x on the right side and I get plus or minus two on the left side. So I mean, that makes sense. I plug in two, that gives me zero underneath the radical. If I plug in negative two, that gives me zero under the radical. Right? So, what sort of inequality do I have here? Well, <clears throat> I get two actually. If I plug in anything bigger than two, I get the negative. If I plug in anything less than negative two, Squaring that gives me some positive number bigger than 4. Then I've got a negative under the radical sign. So these are the numbers. These are the, the intervals which give me a negative sign under the radical. And that's not allowed. So what is allowed is everything else. So we can plug in negative 2 and we can plug in two, and we can plug in anything in between them. That's our domain. Okay. But, caveat, they're telling us that we can't use anything outside of 0 to 2. So this gets back at the question that was asked much earlier on. So what we do in this case is we actually take the whole domain that we've discovered and we intersect it with what we've been given. So the domain of F here is this intersection. Uh, this is a this is a common thing. It's called a restriction. So I'm going to say in words here, f of x is restricted uh, to zero to two. So normally f is very free and it, it can take any value between negative two and two. But in this problem, we are restricting it to zero to. And if I showed you the graph, it would be painfully obvious why. This is actually the graph of a circle, or at least the upper half of a circle of radius two centered at zero. When you restrict it, what you're doing is you're cutting off this left side. So all of this, you're cutting off. So I'll erase that. And what do we have now? We've got a quarter of a circle. And in particular, we've got an inverse. Because we can take a horizontal line everywhere and no horizontal line crosses that graph in more than one place. Before, we, we did with the half circle we did. Okay, so what is the exact inverse is my next question. Is it the plus or the minus up here? Well, it's gotta be the plus. 
if I graphed this whole inverse function, I'll do that in purple, what we would get is we would actually get this with this bottom half, which is not a function. So what do we do to eliminate that? We erase the bottom quarter. That's the negative half of it. Graphing these things really can help. It really can help you determine these things uh, very quickly. But again, that depends on you being able to graph them. So I think the question was a little bit more was to find the domain and range of these things. So I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick. What's the range of f? Well, this is, this is the uh, you know the smallest possible output up to the highest possible output. And so, if you think about this, how big can you make this square root? Well, you can make it as as big as two. You plug in zero, and you get the square root of four. That's the biggest we can make that that argument for the square root. So this is the largest value that this function can take. And then you think about what's the smallest I can make this? Well, it's going to be 0, because the smallest you can make this argument is 0 by plugging in 2 or negative 2. So that's the range. Okay, it's just asking how big can I make this function? How small can I make this function? And then are there any gaps in there? You know, maybe do I have to make a union here of multiple things? You don't in this case because of the exact function that was given, but OK. Um, how about the inverse function? Domain and range. I claim that this is this is extremely easy, and that you're looking right at it. Would it I could go ahead. Would it still be the same as the domain and range for the first one? Yes. Now, now here, this is a bit confusing. So let me let me write this. This is exactly what that is. Now, this is confusing because these are the same thing, right? They say exactly the same thing. So I want you to tell me explicitly. This domain is which one of these two? It's it's obviously zero two. It's one of those, but which one? I'll lead you with another question. A function takes a domain and sends it a domain value and sends it to a range value. The inverse, well, what is the inverse? It's the opposite process. So where does the inverse take its input from? Would it take it from the x and y value? So it would be two negative two? No, I guess I'm saying from, oh. does the inverse, so here we go. So here's, I'll draw a diagram. Domain, range, your function f takes this value and sends it over here. Right? f inverse goes in the reverse direction. So what is the domain of the inverse function? Is it the domain of the original or the range of the original? It's the range of the original. Yes. Does that make sense? Right? Your function takes a domain value, and one of its domain values, and sends it to its range. Those range values become the inputs to the inverse. And the inverse takes those range values back to the domain of the original function. 
So you swap the inputs with the outputs for the inverse. So both of these are in fact 0, 2. But that's just because the domain and range of the original function were the same. This is, this is a general fact that if you have a function oops, and a function inverse, the domain of the original function is the range of the inverse. And the range of the original function is the domain of the inverse. And the, the, the easy way to see that is just to diagram it out like this to look at where things are going back and forth. Okay. Okay. So that that's a lot on inverses. I did not think to spend that much time on inverses. This is the way things always happen, I think. So <laughs> let's go ahead to chapter 3.1, if that's okay with everybody. Um, while I pull up a question, I've got another poll question. Um, so here we go. This one was on, this section was on quadratics. So I'll go ahead and get a question ready while we try this. So the question is, what is the x coordinate of the quadratic 2x squared? I'll draw it out here just in case. 2x squared minus 2x plus 4. What is the x coordinate? Oh, I, I did not. Uh, uh, what is the x coordinate of what? I need to edit this. Let me say it's the x coordinate of the vertex. Ah. Uh, what is the x coordinate of the vertex of this quadratic? I wonder if I can stop it and restart it over to give you guys your guesses back. What is the x coordinate of the vertex of the quadratic 2x squared minus 2x plus 4? I'll give you a minute to think about that. Got 11 people have answered. What is the x-coordinate of the vertex of the quadratic? What is the x-coordinate? You could literally pick anything. <laughs> There's, you can plug in any x, so that, that's a nonsensical question. So what is the x-coordinate of the vertex of this quadratic? Got 17, it's two more people. I'll give you uh, 30 seconds to throw in an answer if you don't have it yet. Meanwhile, I've got the next question ready. Um, so if you haven't thrown in an answer yet, try to throw one in in the next 15 seconds. Okay. Most people said one half. One half. It looks like almost the same number of people said two. So it turns out the correct answer is the opposite. 
of negative 2 over twice 2. This 2, negative 2 rather, is right here. We sometimes call that the b value. So this is the opposite of b. This 2 here came from right here. That's a, usually called a. This number here, 4, is usually called c. And to find the x-coordinate of the vertex of any quadratic, you take the opposite of b over twice a. So there's a simple formula for that. Um, okay, so in this case that's actually one half. That's two over four which is one half. So great job those of you who had that. There's a question in the chat, is there a group me for this class? Uh, I am an old fart, I don't know what a group me is. So, <laughs> no? I'm gonna say no, question mark? I could Google what that is, but I, I, I don't think there's a group me. It's a group chat for students, like, so, you know, like, be able to communicate any, like, um, what's it called, like, problems that they're having with the class, or, you know, like, just as a space for students to be able to speak about the content that we're learning. Okay. Um, if there isn't already one, I'll, I'll make one so that next week I can share with the rest of the students. Yeah, sure. I'll yeah. post it in the chat next week if you do that. That's fine. All right. Thank you. Um, I think, let's see, I don't think, um... Maybe on Blackboard, not that that's a great solution to anything, but on Blackboard there might be something like a discussion board or something like this for the class. Uh, I can look that I can look into that after this. But a, a group me seems to be the equivalent thing. So yeah, that'd be great, Giselle, if you would do that. Okay. Um, so here's the next question then. 2x squared plus 12x plus 10. Uh, this is coming from section 3.1 and we're being asked to put this thing into standard form. Now I wanna say first that to me, the way I learned these things, this is standard form. The way that your textbook and certain other textbooks say standard form is, is actually what I call vertex form. Uh, but this form is what I call standard form, where it's all multiplied out. Sometimes though, if you have a quadratic written like this, this is called standard form, and this is what they're trying to get us to turn this one into. So I'm gonna take us through this real quick because this involves completing the square, which is something that I think everybody could practice at. So we want to take a quadratic in this form and change it to this form. And the general way we're going to do that is we're going to make use of this pattern that we learned from a previous section about squares. So if you remember, if I were to multiply this out, foil it out, I would get x squared, that first thing squared. I would get this last thing squared, so the h, and in between, I would actually have 2 times h times x. It's twice the product of x and h. Now it's there's another one which was x plus h squared. And if I were to foil this out, I would get something very similar. But the difference is only going to be right here. like that. There's a plus sign instead of a minus sign. Okay. So this these two patterns we're going to we're going to I wouldn't say abuse them, we're going to use them. We're going to try and manipulate this equation or this expression that we're given on the left here. We're going to try and manipulate it so that we can create one of these guys. Okay, so we're going to try and manipulate this so that a part of it 
fits this pattern or this pattern, one of the two, and then we're gonna factor it in the exact way that we're uh, that the pattern allows us to. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna have to do here is we're gonna have to factor out this two. Whenever you're asked to place a quadratic into vertex form uh, or standard form, or if you're asked to factor the quadratic, the first thing you always do is get rid of this two or this whatever number that is multiplied in front because it it's not here. It's not here either. You always factor that out first. So that's all that's our first quick and easy step. So we divide every term by two. So two x squared over two is just x squared. Twelve x over two is six x. Ten over two is five. this point you might be really tempted to do this and you you would have found a correct a correct factoring but that's not vertex form that's not standard form the beauty of vertex form or standard form is that you can tell me right away just by looking at it what the vertex is so, so how do we change this now into one of these two? And I, it's going to be this one. Well, we want to make sure that we have this pattern exactly. So we've got the x squared. That's great. Do we have 2 times h times x? Well, we almost do. Let me rewrite it this way. x squared plus 2 times 3 times x. The reason I did that is because this pattern has a 2 times an x and an h. So this tells us right here that our h is 3. So if we're trying to fit this to the pattern, our h must be 3. What is h squared? Because we need that in the pattern too. Well, h squared is 9. Do we have a nine here? No, we've got five. So we're gonna do one of these tricks. X squared plus two times three times X. We're gonna force it to be a nine by adding four and subtracting four just like that. 5 is equal to 9 minus 4. So we can add 4 to 5 as long as we also subtract 4 from 5. So at this point, we actually have the pattern. We have this exact pattern on the right. x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. So let's, let's factor that. So 2 times this part factored x plus 3 I'm going to write it like this though squared that's x plus 3 squared h was 3 right so this is x plus h squared and then we've got a minus 4 left over we only factored this part So the minus four is still there. So we used this pattern, not this one. Okay, and then next, what do we do? I'm gonna multiply this out. So two times x minus a negative three squared I'm just going to multiply the 2 by that and multiply the 2 by the negative 4, which gives us that. And this is the form that, no, I just erased, didn't I? This is the form that I just erased. 
a times x minus something squared plus something. So I could rewrite this as well, plus a negative 8 to make it look exactly like that form. So this question 22, we wanted to take this quadratic and turn it into standard form as they called it, which is this, and we've done that. Okay, this is, this is really nice because now if I asked you what the x coordinate of the vertex is here, what is it? x coord of the vertex is negative three. Negative three. And how about the y coordinate? Negative eight. Negative eight. <laughs> That's awesome. This, this form is really nice for things like that. Whatever this number is after a subtraction sign here, that's the x coordinate. You don't need to take a formula, plug things in, and get it. And this tells you the y coordinate. It's that easy. Okay? So this, this type of problem is a little bit difficult, um, but there you go. Okay, the next problem, if I can move on, is to graph polynomials. Now that, that previous section had us finding max values and min values of quadratics. Um, it's not too difficult. The, the vertex is always either the maximum or the minimum. Um, so th that's pretty much the gist of that whole section. So once you found this value, that's either the maximum or the minimum. And how do you know which? It's whether this number here is positive or negative, because that, that determines if the quadratic, the parabola opens up if it's positive, or opens down if it's negative. So this negative eight, because this is a positive two, is at the bottom of the quadratic, which means that's the minimum value. The next section is much more difficult and it's polynomial functions in general and graphing polynomial functions just in general. The class is going to be over in 11 minutes. I have extra time so I can keep going and um, what I'll do is at 9.20 I'll stop this recording and then I'll start a new one. And so I'll, if you can stick around that, that'd be fine. If you can't stick around, um, I'm gonna, I'll go for another maybe a couple more problems after 920 hits and I'll throw up both recordings. So this problem solving lecture as one and then I'll upload a second one where I just do a couple of these polynomial graph questions. Um, this is definitely the harder part and so I wanted to hit that. I hope that's okay. Um, again, if you can't stick around, that's fine. You can watch the recording um, later. Okay, so let's try and get one done. Before I get there, because there's been a lot of questions today, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start from a, a more uh, sort of ground up approach. I'm going to start from the ground here instead of just jumping right in. So let's take any polynomial. It's like, this is a pretty daunting question. Take any polynomial. So it doesn't matter what it is, like 3x to the 10th minus 2x to the 7th plus dot, dot, dot take any polynomial and something that is true is that this thing can factor into linear uh, factors so it could be like I don't know x minus 1 times x plus 5 times x minus root 2 dot 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 so this, this is a fact that if you take any polynomial in one real variable, you can factor it completely using imaginary and complex numbers. So maybe one of these factors or lots of them is actually an imaginary number like x minus i. Maybe. There are certain cases where you can factor it only in, in real numbers. There are certain other cases where you can factor it using only integers. 
uh, but there's a lot of these cases where factors are uh, irrational, like square root 2. There's a lot of cases where factors are complex valued, like square root of negative 1, i. Uh, but this is a general fact, that if you take any polynomial, you can factor it into a, a, a product of these factors. And we've practiced this with quadratics. Right, I've, I've even in this last one, we had this, which is a great example. x squared plus 6x plus 5. This is a polynomial. It's degree 2. And it factors very nicely into this. OK? So if I took a different one, I might, you know, if I take this one, the same thing, and I multiply it by a linear factor, I'm going to just choose x plus 1 again, you know, it's going to give me something that's like x cubed plus stuff. And it would still factor, and it would factor pretty nicely on the left side because I've multiplied by another x plus 1 on the right side. I get this thing squared now because I've just introduced a new factor of x plus 1. And I could keep doing this. I could take this original quadratic that we had, and I could create a whole bunch of different polynomials with really high degrees. And all I would do is you know, keep adding factors here onto this list. I could make that list as long as I wanted. And some of them would be repeated multiple times. Some of them would only have one. You know, I could I could multiply by x to the fifth, and then my factorization is x to the fifth times x plus five, x plus one squared. It doesn't matter. My point is, you can you can see how we can easily construct these things actually. So the a big part of section three point two was if I gave you just this fully factored thing, what can you tell me about the zeros of the polynomial? And what can you tell me about the graph of the polynomial at those zeros? So I can write that down. What can we say? about the zeros of this polynomial and uh, about the graph of the polynomial near these zeros. Okay, so that's a, that's a really good question. So first, how many zeros does this polynomial have. So what inputs can I plug in to make this product zero? The way you usually do this is you take each factor and you set it equal to zero. So let's take x to the fifth, set it equal to 0, and we'll solve. Because when that factor is 0, the whole product is 0. So x equals 0 is actually a 0. 0 is a 0. It's not always that way. x plus 5, if we set that factor equal to 0, and if we can find a number, we can. It's just negative 5. If we plug in negative 5, we're going to get that factor is 0. And then the whole product is 0. x plus 1, set it equal to 0, which means x equals negative 1. If I plug in negative 1, this, this, this factor becomes 0, which means the whole product becomes 0. Are there any other zeros? The answer is no. So these are the three zeros. Another thing I talked about in the class is 
What is the multiplicity? of these zeros. That's essentially asking how many times are they... Uh, hmm, how many factors become zero when each is plugged in? Okay, like for example, if I plug in negative 5, how many of these factors become 0? Just one of them. So negative 5 has multiplicity 1. If I plug in negative 1, this factor here becomes 0. But how many of those are multiplied in this big product? There's two of them because of the square. So this one down here has multiplicity 2. If I plug in 0, this x to the fifth becomes 0. But x to the fifth is five zeros multiplied together now. So this, multi this 0 has a multiplicity of 5. Okay, that was another thing in the lecture that I talked about. Multiplicities of zeros. I claim with, with basically these, the information of what the zeros are and their multiplicities, I claim that we can get a very, very good graph of our function, and that's it. That's all we need. No matter how crazy the polynomial is, if I can find the zeros, and if I can determine their multiplicities, I could give you a really good approximate graph. And that was the whole point of section 3.2, sort of, sort of a final statement. And that's what I'm going to do next. But it is 3.20, or sorry, it is 9.20. Um, and so class is officially timed out here. Uh, I'm going to keep going, like I said, and I'm, I'm actually not going to stop this recording until, um, until I finish with this problem. Then I'll stop the recording, I'll start a new one, and I'll keep recording on a couple more problems like this. Um, just to give you more examples, because I didn't give any during the theoretical lecture on Monday. Um, I wanted to give them here, but the first section on inverses we took a lot of time on. Which I could tell we needed, so that's, that's okay, that's a good thing. Um, but I don't want to keep you if you can't stay. So it's 920. Thank you for coming. If you uh, have any questions, please shoot me an email. Um, I've The last two office hours, I think, I haven't had anyone stop by. So if you can't make it and you have questions, <clears throat> uh, please shoot me an email. I, I've scheduled times outside of normal office hours for students in the past. So please do that. Uh, I, my schedule is is not entirely flexible. I do have my own classes to attend, but um, but I can and will make time for you. So uh, you're welcome to everyone that's saying thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Um, I will see you next week, Wednesday. Uh, next week, Friday, Thursday and Friday, we are taking our chapters one and two test. So I'll be putting out sort of a, a study guide, if you will. Uh, but the test is over all of chapters one and two. No particular chapter is emphasized. No particular section is emphasized. Uh, it's just the sections you've done homework on. It's not all the ones that we've that we've skipped over as well. It's just the ones we've done homework on. So study your homework. Study the study guide that I'll send out here, and uh, and come to office hours if you have questions. Okay. But other than that, have a great week, and I'll I'll talk to you next time. Okay. All right, so for those of you that can stay, Thank you. you're welcome, you're welcome. For those of you that can stay, I'm gonna graph this one. And uh, it's, not, it's not gonna take too long. All right. So 
when you've got a factored polynomial and you know it's zeros then, and obviously it's multiplicities, which are just these powers, it's actually it's actually a really kind of a fun little fun little pattern, I would say. If the uh, zero or the multiplicity for a zero is even, there's a specific thing that happens in the graph. And another thing, if the multiplicity <clears throat> for a zero is odd, there's another specific pattern that happens. And it's really kind of fun that, that this exists. So let's think about just some common examples that we know. Uh, x squared, that's, a, that's another polynomial. Its graph has a zero at zero, right? Or it has a zero at zero. And what does the graph do? Well, it comes down, it touches that that point, just just barely graces it, and then bounces right back up. Okay, this is this is a multiplicity of two. It's an even multiplicity. Let's think about another graph that we know of, x cubed. It also has a zero at zero, but this time it's got an odd multiplicity. And we know the graph, I suspect. It comes up, it bends here to that zero, but it doesn't bounce back. It keeps going, it passes through the axis. This is exactly the pattern. If the multiplicity for a zero is even, the graph touches the x-axis at that zero but bounces back. Okay. So actually it doesn't matter how complicated the whole polynomial is. Close to that zero, the multiplicity of the zero is the only thing that, that matters. You can sort of forget that all the other factors exist and just focus on that one. So, oops, there we go. So if I just focus on the only even factor that we've got here, the only even multiplicity factor here, x plus one. Here's my x-axis. Here's the zero, negative one. I have no idea what this graph does out here or over here. I have no idea at this point. But close to this negative one, our graph does something that's very patterned. It either comes down from above, touches that here, and then bounces back up. So it, close to this zero, it looks like this, or it comes up from below, touches it there, and then goes back down. And that's, that's determined entirely by this two. So it's one of those two options. Which one will determine in just a little bit? What happens with odds? Again, it the graph passes right through. So the graph touches the x-axis at that zero and passes through. We saw that in the example of x cubed. So let's take these other two zeros and put them on our x-axis. We've got negative five and we've got zero. Now I'm not drawing this to scale because it'd be too smashed in there. So what happens at negative five? I'll draw this one in purple. Well, negative five has a multiplicity of one. So it's gonna either come up from down below, touch that axis at negative five, and keep going and then somehow connect up here 
or it's going to come from up above, touch here, keep going, and then somehow connect here. It could wiggle a couple times, I don't know, but it, it's just going to connect there. At zero, it's the exact same story. Either it connects down here, comes up, and passes through, or it connects up here somehow, passes down through, like that. And this is all just determined by the odd multiplicities here. So if I were to I were to give sort of my best guess at what this graph looks like. I'm going to erase this, and move this over. Wow. Move this over. What is my best guess for this graph? Here's my y axis, here's my x axis. My best guess needs to come from one of these two possibilities. How you determine which possibility is, is you just pick a test point and you, you just see. So I'm going to pick the point negative 2. If I plug in negative 2, and I get a positive number out. That means that the graph, my best guess, is this purple one. If I plug in negative 2 and I get a negative number, then my best guess is this green one. Because at negative 2, the graph is below the x-axis. It's taking negative values. So let's just do that. Negative 2. So negative 2 to the fifth. Is that a positive or a negative number? It's negative. x, excuse me, negative 2 plus 5, that's a positive number. That's positive 3. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative, but when I square it, I get a positive number. So we've got a negative times two positives, which means we have a negative result, which means our graph is down here, which means the green one is my best guess. So I'm going to graph it. Here's negative 5, and this time I'm going to try and actually scale it. Here's negative 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah, that's, that's not bad. Maybe move 1 over just a little. So here's negative 1 and negative 5, and then we obviously have 0 there. So these are my zeros. And my best guess is this green one. So it's going to come down. It's going to pass through that 0. It's going to come here. It's going to pop up and bounce right off that 0, come down, and then pass up and through that. Okay, that's my best guess. And now is where we all get to have a little bit of fun. We're going to see. I think you're seeing my Desmos window now, right? Yeah, here we go. The graph was x to the fifth times x plus 5 times, oh boy, x to the fifth times x plus 5 times x plus 1 squared. And how do you like that? That is not even at all what we got. What did I miss? x to the fifth, x plus 5, x plus 1 squared, 5, 6, 7, 8. I'm not zoomed out enough. How do you like that? Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so you're seeing my...
let's see. You're still seeing Desmos. Okay. So I'm, I'm zoomed way in here. You can see at negative one, it does bounce right off. Okay, then it comes back down and it goes up and passes through zero. It kind of levels off. I didn't put that in my graph, right? So mine wasn't a, mine wasn't a great approximation. At negative five, oh boy, our graph is really vertical there. It goes up really fast. Like really fast. So how, how good was our estimate? Well, it, it was pretty good. This thing needs to be way more vertical, way more vertical. And then it needs to come up and it just needs to like almost touch and barely come down and then basically rock it off like that. Our guess was pretty close. Um, does the fact that it has multiple, like the multiplicity of five, does that make it vertical or does that only impact the bouncing off and the keeping going? That's a great question. Um, hmm. So, so the second question, um, that the, the multiplicity only affects whether it goes through or if it bounces off. That, that's all the multiplicity affects in terms of that. Your second or your first question is very interesting because it's about the rate of change of the function near that point. Mm -hmm. And that's a much harder question to answer. It's okay. I just thought that the fact that it was a multi like a multiplicity of five that had to do mm -hmm. with the fact that it was vertical because they were five zeros. No, I think I think the bigger the bigger thing that's affecting the rate here is that this this is really close to x to the eighth power. Right, so when you get when you get a little bit away from a zero, like if you get if you get like over to six, for example, negative six, yeah. you're you're a total value of one away from a zero here. So this yeah. thing is this thing is one, or negative one rather. But what about all the other zeros? Right, these are big numbers now. Like this one is this one's negative five. That's pretty big. This one's negative six. That's pretty big. And you're taking them to the eighth power. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's okay. huge, right? So so when you when you have a, a really high polynomial degree overall, that really affects the how, how vertical those things become. Okay. Um, the multiplicity, right, the higher those multiplicities become, the more of that exaggeration you have but it, it's not necessarily going to tell you how steep it is at that zero. Okay. Uh, although I could think of some interesting cases where it does. So so yeah, no, there's there is a pattern there, but it's not as obvious I think as as I'd like to get into. <laughs> Great question. Great question. Okay, so I'm going to stop this recording, and I'm going to start another one with just and I'll do a couple more problems. So hold on one sec.